Hi there, everybody. It's nice to see such a good crowd. Uh, welcome to our afternoon of oral history. Here we have uh, a new interviewer, and I get to do the introduction for him. And the, though I don't think this is a man who needs no introduction. <laughs> If you uh, have been to town meeting, he's on the finance committee, he was the selectman, uh, he's on the Stoke Food Pantry, Council on Aging, uh, Community Chess member, Community Housing Corporation, and if you ever caught some of those shows on TV, <laughs> the TV April Fool's show, Steve has been one of our stars. So, thank you, Steve. Well, in case you've all forgotten, um, it was in, in 1669 that Stowe was established as the plantation of Papasiticate. That was a mere 345 years ago. But don't worry, we're not going to cover the entire three and a half centuries today. But we will spend some time in the 18th century, in the 1700s specifically, talking with our, our, some of our guests this afternoon. We have three speakers who have kindly donated their time today to talk to us. And the first gentleman is a Mr. Skip Warren. Also, a figure is known probably to everybody in the room and beyond. Just a brief uh, overview of, Sif, of uh, Skip's background. <clears throat> Pardon me. He was born in 1932, the son of Franny and Mary Coburn Warren. He was born and raised in Stowe and is currently the owner of Pilot Grove Farm. And you all know where that is. The farm has been in the family now since 1782 when it was purchased by Abijah Warren. Although he's been in Stowe all of his life at the farm, he was born in Lowell. And then, uh, aside from a two-year stint uh, in Korea, from 54 to 56, he was at Pilot Grove Farm um, the rest of the time. Skip graduated from UMass Amherst in 1957 with a degree in animal science. <clears throat> he's worked on the farm with parents and later worked uh, in the Warren Insurance Agency for 36 years. So. <clears throat> Without further ado, I would like to invite Skip Warren to come up to the chair. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> My mother insisted that I had to be born in Lowell because she was born and brought up in Chelmsford. So my father had to get into a, I guess, a Model A pickup truck and drive to Lowell in the middle of the winter in February. But Almost all of my ancestors before, seem to have been born on the farm. And my great, great, great grandfather, a biker, came from Western in 1782. And he, he bought land along what was known as Strong Water Brook, but we never call it that. But I'll speak about that later. And it was, most of the farm was land that was one of the original 12 lots in Stowe. And it, the, two, the farm was owned by two people, uh, Thomas Stevens and Stephen Hall. And if you look on the, um, the quilt that's in the uh, town hall, you can see those two names on the quilt. And a few years ago, somebody by the name of Hall came to the farm to, to look to see where their ancestor had been. I'm known as the shepherd of Stowe, I guess. <laughs> I brought my staff along, yeah, okay? I didn't bring any sheep. They don't, they don't move along too well and behave themselves too well. But so many people know the farm as just sheep. And Marilyn said to me and some other people said, we don't know what happened, what was going on before, before you had the sheep. And so I have to go back a little bit and um, to see what we did. And 
Everyone had horses and cows. They had sheep, probably goats, they had chickens. Everybody was pretty well self-sufficient. Everybody had food that they raised in their garden and they probably bartered with their neighbors and they probably did the same thing with meats and things. And everybody slaughtered their animals right at home and then they dried, preserved, put them in brine, put the meat in brine. Now there's too many rules and regulations and we don't slaughter on the farm anymore. We have to have it professionally done. I, um, everybody was aware back in the 1700s, 1800s, there were no markets, supermarkets like we have today. And there were a few small stores. I remember when I grew up, little grocery stores and things, but not anything like we have today where you see hundreds and thousands of items are on the shelves. Everyone was growing things and my father and grandfather and so forth, they, they raised squash and asparagus. And there was a, a market in Boston where people took their vegetables and the things and even sold hay. That was why they called it Haymarket Square. And I remember when in the 1940s we were raising asparagus and a Ralph Stiles would stop in and take the asparagus to Boston and Phil and Liz Mosley were sitting right over there. They live at the Stiles farm and I, I very, very remember putting the, seeing the boxes of asparagus um, sat out in the yard and Mr. Stiles would take it into Boston. And up in our uh, carriage horse barn, I can find these great big covers that they used to put over the squash plants. So it verifies that squash and so forth were raised. I don't remember too much about it, but I can see that it was done. I do remember the asparagus and my father had a field called the asparagus field. Horses were a very important part of the farm and, and I can see why because back in the 1700s, 1800s didn't have the machinery that we have today. And horses were um, used for all kinds of things. If you go down to Pennsylvania you can see the Amish doing what our families did years ago on the farms with the horses. And I, I think that um, the horses, I remember the horses were very important in the, after the hurricane of 1938, when thousands and thousands of, maybe millions of trees were, were, fall, fell in New England after the hurricane on September 21st. And I remember for about two years, we hauled logs out of the woods and there was always a lot of lumber and there are pictures in my father's um, history book and others of piles and piles of lumber at the C.D. Fletcher property. And I, I, I very much remember going into the woods and. And I was six years old in first grade when this hurricane struck. And it was a dark and windy day and I came home and, and my grandmother was taking care of me and my two sisters. And my mother and grandfather had gone to a, a meeting. And I very much remember that the trees began to sway and I asked my grandmother if they would fall, would fall and she said, oh no. They won't fall, but pretty soon trees began to fall. And as we all know, you've seen the pictures. It was terrible. My grandmother said, Skip will probably never believe me again. But this is, this is, is what's happened. Um, I'm sure that f farms had, uh, must have had sheep because they had to get wool to uh, spin into yarns and, and of course later on cotton was growing in the south and they got the cotton. But uh, 
I, th I think that I mentioned about the horses disappearing, and they began to go in the 1930s, perhaps, and when the tractors became available, and, and we switched to tractors. And I, we have all this uh, modern equipment today, and I sometimes think we're just as well off if we had some workhorses. But we probably would not get as much done as fast, but I think working with the horses would have been an interesting life. I just barely saw that. We had, um, um, by the time I was around, the automobiles took us everywhere. And my, right here in this picture is my grandfather, Henry Warren. And his, my grandmother, um, uh, my father said my grandmother needed to go somewhere. She had to hook the horse up to the buggy. And the women had to learn how to do this too. It was, it was necessary if they wanted to go somewhere. And when I was born, my parents had dairy cows. Now, some of you might remember the cows, but most everybody here is fairly new to Stowe and, and uh, don't remember the cows. In the 19, well, about in late 1930s, my father and mother established a delivery milk group in Stowe and Hudson. And my sisters, my two sisters and I helped, along with many teenagers in Stowe who worked on the farm, we helped deliver milk. And we, um, at first we delivered seven days a week, I think partly because of refrigeration and people didn't have refrigerators in the 1930s. And, and uh, or, they, or they maybe had them, but they had to use ice. Anyway, um, we went year round, and then later on, we um, didn't deliver every day. We, we did one route on Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and another route Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. During World War II, we also made butter and cottage cheese. And these were things that, that we did. And I, I remember that everybody has been through some tough times, but I don't know. We got through World War II, and somehow we survived. And, and um, I, I had uh, chickens in world, during World War II with the Fadis while I was in grammar and high school. And I sold eggs for $1.10 dollar, dollar a dozen. Gas was 29 cents, okay? Gas is more than 10 times that, but eggs are not more than 10 times that. So things happen over the period of time. But I remember it. I made, um, I made a few dollars selling eggs. And uh, I also sold some meat, too, because I bought baby chicks and, and had, had them. I, for years, my family had an apple orchard on Park Grove Hill, and that would have been um, over on this hill here. And they had, um, we also had a peach orchard on Crescent Street, which is um, down near Cobble Hill, which was an area that we call Cobble Hill. And I remember very distinctly having the apple orchard on the hill. And, and uh, my grandfather had apples and peaches too because he talked about selling the peaches. Everything was going well until 1938 when the hurricane blew over most of the apple trees. I think all other orchards had the same problem, I'm sure. The trees were righted up with wires, but along in 1944 comes another hurricane and took the trees down. And I, father tells about they decided that that was it, and he did horizontal pruning, he called it. 
right down to the ground, got rid of the apple trees, took out the stumps, and returned the apple orchard into a hay field or a place for grazing. And we used to move the cows, not all summer long, but occasionally when they needed some food, we would move the cows across West Acton Road to the hill. Now, back then, they, there were stone walls and fences, and it was cows. Well, they got out, but they didn't usually get out. And we drove the cows across the street in the morning, and then in the afternoon brought them back for milking. And my sister tells about going out to the street to stop the cars when the cows were going to cross, and people would say, well, what do I got to stop for? And she said, because the cows are coming, and pretty soon the cows would come, and then the people would be a little alarmed when the cows got all around their cars. But I don't think we could move the cows back and forth today at the rate that cars go by. And also, you don't move sheep as easily as you do cows. A lot of people asked about why the sheep didn't graze, but because just no way to get them across the road, and they wasn't safe wasn't safe to leave them there at, at, um, at night. And um, after we stopped grazing the, um, the cows there, we began to make hay. But it, it's, it's, um, uh, this hill is quite steep in places, as you know. And, um, now, now the, um, the hill is not very much owned by me. The family over the last 30 years have sold land to the Stoke Community Housing Project who wanted a place to build housing for the elderly, low income, things like that. And so it is the, it, it was the least productive land, and it's something my father and mother wanted to do, and we're just opening up a second uh, a group of apartments um, in, in July. Just, just had the dedication the other day. I, um, along Strongwater Brook, there was a tannery, and I guess it was called strong water because of the, the, um, the brook came out of the woods and it, probably the water was a little acid, but the tannery requires tan bark. And my uh, relative of my family, uh, A relative of my family and uh, Peter Fletcher had the tannery along the brook. And they got tan bark in Ashburnham. And they also had a tannery in, in Ashburnham. And Levi Warren had a leather business in Boston. And Peter Fletcher, as I say, involved, and uh, my great-grandfather's, excuse me, my great-great-grandfather's sister, Betsy Warren, married Peter Fletcher. So a lot of you know that my family is related to the Fletchers, and then we got related to, a, to the Fletchers again when my um, grandmother, wife of my grandfather, Henry, married... Um, her sister married C.D. Fletcher. So along the way, all the families kind of got intermarried. I, I um, have just a little bit of story to add about Levi. I have a great niece who just had a baby a year ago. And she was looking for family names. And she said she liked the name Levi. And then she said he was a tanner. So that's his middle name. So I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> very, very interesting. Tanner could be a first name, too. Um, I spoke about World War II when uh, we raised chickens and so forth. And 
it was gas rationing, but I guess we were able to get enough gas to, to drive the vehicle to deliver milk and so forth. We, um, we've done a lot of other things on the farm, too. Back about 1975, I think, we started to hold an open bar, and maybe it was a little bit fun. I'm not sure now. Because people began to want to see the lambs, and we'd be wanted to share the lambs. And I need to back up just a little bit. I got into the sheep business in 1948, when I was in 4-H. And I started with two sheep, and I still have sheep after 66 years, I guess, 66 years. And I started with Shropshires, who are black-faced, about 25 years ago. I added Dorsets, who are white-faced. And then I crossed the two breeds. Uh, to get a better market lamb. And uh, so I have been um, involved with the sheep for um, a, a long, a very long, long time. And my family began to hold the open barn. And the first year, I think we had 75 people. And it became a very popular event. And after about 15 years, we we were approaching 1,800 people in one day. And it got a little spooky. <laughs> and so we decided not to advertise in the Boston papers. It was too much. And then all of a sudden, the raccoons started to have rabies. And we were required to, to vaccinate the lambs. And so you have to vaccinate just when they're three months old. And after that, the lambs are no longer cute. So having an open barn became a very difficult time. We now allow visitors at special times. And I have to be so careful. It's a shame that the, that the rabies has spread to the uh, skunks and other things, too. Um, I. This picture of my grandfather and that Marilyn enlarged here, thank, thank you very much. Uh, I think it means a lot because it shows the grove of pine trees on the top of Pine Grove Hill. And the story is that these pine trees uh, could be seen by pilots on ships coming into Boston Harbor. And I think there were other hills in around here that trees could be seen too. So that's how the name Pilot Grove Farm came. I had a neighbor once who climbed one of these trees back in the, before they all fell in the two hurricanes. And they said that you can see Boston Harbor. So I guess it has to be true. But it's a nice name. The farm was not named that until 1790. They'd been here a little while before they, before they, uh, before they realized that. I, um, there are a lot of things I could say about the people who worked on the farm, but I would rather you, you, some of you have read the book that Father wrote about the different people from Finland and Ireland and Sweden and so forth who worked in the mills, and they worked on the farms in Stowe, and, and Father used to have lots of stories about the people who, who worked in the, um, who worked on the farms, and I, uh, I remember a lot of the people who worked. I, oh, just one thing about ice. When I was a little boy, my father and grandfather got ice from Fletcher's Pond, and we had an ice house. And they brought the ice in the summer, put sawdust around it, and then but everybody had an ice house. All farms had an ice house. And I think that uh, I can see why it was very important. And um, we had ice delivered, big cakes of ice, way up into the 1940s before we had a refrigerator. We had ice 
big 200 or 5 pounds of ice, and we have a, had a big uh, ice box that was off the kitchen. And so, but there's a lot of things that I can't say because I don't have time. And, um, that, but if you read Father's book, he wrote a lot of things. And this is my shepherd's staff. Genuine sheep's horn. I can't say ram's horn because some of the ewes also have horns. My sheep don't have horns, but I'm Jew. And the story about this is my neighbor, neighbors, Sherry and Doreen Gibson, gave this to me, and Doreen's father brought it from Scotland. And the story is that when he was at Heathrow Airport, he got a lot of questions about where were the sheep. I suppose today, Mr. Lindsay would not have been able to get this through security. There would have probably been some problem, but anyway. I'm, I'm grateful to have it, and I, um, I don't know if anybody has any quick questions, but I think I need to stop talking. <laughs> I can't hear him. I didn't want to make this public question, but was there any uh, discussion? I heard that there's one way to develop brain cancer because of the woman in her 